Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Mavellis with Lee Vick. I'm going to talk today about globally asynchronous, locally synchronous clocks. Lee, what is GALS? Globally asynchronous, locally synchronous. What does that actually mean? GALS is a technique that deploys locally synchronous modules interconnected and communicating with asynchronous uh, interfaces. Why now? What's changed? The complexity. Put simply, the demands of modern, of modern SLC designs are significant. The scale of the designs, the requirements to meet uh, significant timing challenges, the, the envelope for traditional designs have been pushed to the breaking point. If you have a single PLL in the corner and you're trying to drive a clock across the entire design, the traditional uh, techniques that are deployed, the H-trees, the clock meshes, uh, and the clock tree synthesis tools are really being pushed to the breaking point we need to find new methodologies and new approaches to help relieve some of those design burdens. Well, let's take a closer look. Sure. We, what are we looking at? So what we're looking at here is a block diagram of a pseudotypical design uh, that you would see in a modern SOC where you have I.O. and memory interfaces around the periphery. You have an array of compute cores. You have the individual block uh, elements of logic that are being designed uh, by the uh, SOC designer, local memory, Often we see an uh, array of uh, matrix of AI compute tiles and then all connected via a knot. In a traditional architecture, this is what you see from a layout perspective. What you don't see is the one big giant analog PLL in the corner that's trying to drive the, croc the clock across the entirety of the design and in a synchronized manner. And this gets a lot more complicated as we get into chiplets, as we get into lots more data in AI type of chips, right? So what is actually changing here. Why do we need GALS right now versus in the past? With radical limit designs, with the constraints that are being put on modern designs, with the chiplet interfaces, the timing constraints are just becoming too complicated and too onerous to meet with traditional techniques. So new ideas like distributed clocking, and, and to be clear, when we talk about GALS, we're also talking about distributed clocking. Anytime you have local compute elements, driving a localized clock, that's really what we're talking about. And I'm walking through some of the benefits of having individualized clocks across the periphery of this design. And just before we get going, this is really all about partitioning, right? You're really partitioning data and data movement. It is, that's an important part of it. Now, the data movement is where things get interesting. If you have localized clocks, those individual compute elements need to communicate. That typically happens across a NOC. That's part of most traditional architectures anyway. An asynchronous approach versus a synchronous is a little bit more work, but the freedom that it gives you compared to traditional clock design techniques makes it very much worthwhile. Okay, let's dig into how this works. All right, so if you have the ability to more finely manipulate the clocking structure, that gives you benefits whether that clock is static or dynamic, even in the simplest case where you have a static clock. Let's say these particular logic elements are able to be synthesized to different frequencies. The target is all the same, but because of design constraints or other limitations, you may end up meeting timing at different numbers. If you have to use a common clock across these logic elements, as opposed to an individualized clock, then you're falling to the lowest common denominator. If you have individual clocks for each, for each region, you can tie them to the performance that's optimized for their particular segment. And this is one of the key points, right? Because you really need this data to be moving through at exactly the right time. Otherwise, you lose your performance. That's exactly it. You have to have a balanced design. And so having things hampered by the inability to perform at the frequency that they are capable of means you're putting additional and undue stress on the rest of your design. And this also allows you to say, okay, this signal needs to go through. This one does not need to go through as fast, right? This is where your asynchronous locking comes in. Correct. A good example of that is if you have the ability to dynamically manage these clocks, then you can tie the clock for each of your CPU elements to a local clock and they can operate on demand. So traditionally, you have to design your entire infrastructure to handle the worst case performance. So all the, clock, all the CPUs running at maximum clock, maximum power to hit the performance targets. But in the real world, at any given moment in time, some of these cores won't need that much frequency because they're not doing tasks that require that. You can slow them down or idle them, or even in the extreme case, turn them all the way off if you have a clock that's capable of relocking very quickly. And that gives you tremendous opportunities for power savings in these designs. This also has an advantage when you're starting to deal with aging of circuits too, right? Because not everything works at exactly the same speed throughout its lifetime. 
That's exactly correct. And much like you see um, aging being applied from a voltage perspective, same thing happens in frequency, where designs struggle to meet timing uh, as they age. If you have the ability to manipulate the frequencies locally, that gives you the ability to manage that aging process in a more gradual and uh, robust manner. Okay, we've set the stage for this. This gets a lot more complicated when you're actually working with it. What do you have to watch out for? Once you've done the work to define these asynchronous interfaces between the two, then really you're done. And in modern designs, I would argue that as the number of transistors increase, this is becoming more and more common. You don't see homogenous designs with the same clock in the same domain. You're seeing hierarchical designs, modular designs. That is just the way things are going to be designed. And in a tens of billions, hundreds of billions, trillion transistor world, you have to migrate to that. Making those interfaces asynchronous gives you tremendous opportunities for power savings and allows you to do things like increase performance. And what I mean by that is, if you have, for example, in your compute array of AI elements, 128 different elements, but one of those 128 for environmental or aging reasons is unable to hit a particular frequency, if they're on the same clock, they all fall to the lowest common denominator and you're giving up an incredible amount of performance. If you have localized clocks, for either for each element or in a cluster of elements, then you have the ability to on-demand modulate these and release the other cores to get the maximum amount of performance, which you have to have in a modern balanced design. Really what you're doing is getting a lot more granular in how you look at clocking here, right? Yeah, that's precisely the point. And the more granular there are, the more opportunities there are to either increase performance or to save power, both of which are critical in modern designs. And also in this drawing, you have a lot of CPUs, but it could be CPUs and GPUs and NPUs and TPUs, right? Exactly. And the flexibility of deciding where and how often and how many different compute elements or clock elements that you have, whether they're done on a per core or per cluster basis or per block, or maybe not at all, that degree of freedom is something that we're now is exposed, is being exposed to the modern designers thanks to the capabilities that we're bringing in with digital PLLs that didn't exist before. That's why this is being looked at though. This becomes particularly necessary in heterogeneous designs where you may have chiplets that are developed potentially by different companies, done, uh, created in different foundries, running at completely different uh, uh, specs than what you expect from one, one particular foundry, right? Yeah, flexibility is key. You can't build a single design and expect it to work everywhere across all potential interfaces, across the plug fest of a chiplet world. So having the ability to dynamically adjust these clocks in the region of interest allows you more flexibility in terms of how you interface, how you balance the workloads, and how you architect your designs. What's the impact of this on things like signal integrity, which is one of the key elements here? If the clock is designed properly, you shouldn't have any impact. So the robustness and the performance of a traditional analog PLL has to be brought with you as you embed these PLLs directly into your local domain. Instead, what you have to really focus on is making sure that the demands of this require of this environment are met. And they're not met by traditional PLLs. A traditional analog PLL is too large. You can't put 32 of them across your 32 compute elements. A traditional analog PLL requires VDDA. Please go ahead and ask your back-end teams if they would mind punching 32 holes in for 32 VDDA lines in the midst of their C or C of course. I think you're not going to get an answer that you're going to find very receptive. Those are some of the domain constraints that you have, as well as meaning jitter and timing and other parameters. So you have to hit everything that they do and meet the difficult design environment of an embedded design. And each one of those cores is probably going to be running at a different speed, right? So this is another challenge that you have to wrestle with is that particularly as we get into analog, you're, you're now dealing with something that may be 90 nanometers or 250 nanometers and your, your CPU may be running at three nanometers. Yes, exactly. I mean, these need to be modern, advanced, fractional PLLs to allow you to find granularity in terms of your frequency, but that granularity exists for each individual CPU, each region, and the interfaces to the chips. What happens on the software side? We keep thinking about hardware and that's really the, our focus, but software is a key piece of this, right? It has to glue this stuff together. It's as or more critical than the hardware in a modern design. From a software perspective, if you're embedding multiple clocks, distributed clocking, then the software infrastructure needs to be able to manage the complexity of that across your design. And ideally what you want is the same software infrastructure. And what we've seen from our customers is that they're deploying this technology where the same clock 
It's used in a variety of different areas because it has programmability and flexibility. And by leveraging the same software API, they get tremendous software savings by leveraging across a die, across derivatives, and even across other designs on other nodes. If you have the same software infrastructure, you can leverage that where with traditional PLLs, they're all bespoke and the software burden is increased for your firmware team. This isn't off the shelf software though, right? You really have to write it for exactly what you're creating here. Yeah, I mean, you have to have an API for these devices and we do. Uh, you have to be able to do that to, to be able to maintain a certain level of abstraction. You don't want to be drowning in the lower level details. You want an API that allows you enough flexibility that you can say, I have a clock. This is how I want to parameterize it. And if it's part of your solution beyond clocking, then you have to take that into account. So for example, if you're using these clocks not only to manage the frequency, but also as part of a droop mitigation solution, that has to be taken into account. Often what we see is in large arrays of AI elements, there's the potential for causing a droop. If you turn all these on or change the models instantaneously, you can experience a droop event. If the sensor has to tell the PLL that a droop event has happened and you need to modulate the frequency so you don't violate timing, that propagation delay alone can be problematic. So you need to have localized clocking so that that's managed locally, and you need your software to be able to handle the normal clocking demand workload, as well as the ability to manage a uh, droop environment as well. Those are the requirements of a, a distributed clocking solution. And there may, may be dozens of these kinds of chips, or hundreds or even thousands of these kinds of chips out there, right? Which is why you want to be asynchronous on the global level, but locally you want to be synchronous. Of course. Essentially what you're doing is you're reducing the scope from synchronous across the entire die to synchronous within a region, which eases the burden of clock tree synthesis in the existing tools, but allows you much greater degrees of flexibility across the SOC. Where do engineers typically run into problems when working with us? Um, well, to be honest, they haven't really deployed this. This technology, this technique has been around since the 80s. Architecturally, it's very simple. You can sort of intrinsically get what's happening. You're reducing the scope of the problem by distributing clocks. The challenge has been physically we couldn't do it before because we didn't have the techniques. We didn't have the technology to be able to do that. Now we do. Now we're starting to investigate these and all of the requirements that I just described in terms of area and lock times and flexibility from a software perspective have to be there in order to enable this. Now they are. Now we're seeing customers start to migrate to this, uh, to this approach. In fact, our most recent announcement was a collaboration with Tenstorit who are deploying this technology across their die and across multiple projects. And a big part of that is a common firmware infrastructure that they can leverage across multiple designs. In the past, almost everything we did was planar. Does it matter if it now goes into three dimensions? It does not. In fact, one of the demand constraints for this type of approach is that these clocks be very small. In fact, you have to migrate from the analog to the digital domain. And what you see when you migrate to digital is that those advantages in geometry actually help you because these uh, these clocks, while terrifically smaller than analog PLLs, continue to scale even smaller as you go into more advanced geometries. Essentially, the cost of clocking becomes free from an area perspective, which gives you much more degrees of freedom. Where do you expect this to show up? Is it going to be data centers that are really moving a lot of data through? Is it going to be potentially your smartphone? Well, smartphones already deploy very sophisticated clocking mechanisms, as do data center. I think what you'll see because of the complexity of the designs is as you put more transistors doing more workload, you're going to need more modularity in terms of your overall architecture and having localized clocks gives you the ability to design those, stack them as needed in a architectural or a chiplet world, and also be able to resolve some of the design challenges of these really large designs. And we're going to see a lot more of this as we get into the AI world, right? Because we just have so much data moving through that we really do have to parse it and split it into uh, different manageable chunks. Exactly right. And what you're seeing across the AI accelerator domain is a variety of different techniques from GPU to NPU, extended risk 5 cores, hardware accelerators, compute and memory. Each of those have different clocking demands. So the ability to have fine grain manipulation of your clocks and modulate those up and down because of the scale involved any little power savings, any little frequency saving, any optimization in terms of performance is critical because of the scale of those designs. Levick, thanks for a great explanation. My pleasure.